July 1st, 2014 saw a seasoned Italian comedian from New Rochelle climb the last of his 72 stone steps, and finally embody the fictional character he had spent the last 46 years idolising. Having featured heavily on television's preeminent platform for second-rate exhibitionists, Joe Matarese would receive plaudits from the likes of Howard Stern and Howie Mandel for his groundbreaking comedic set during Season 9 of America's Got Talent. The lipless Ginzo would dazzle the judging panel with a litany of familial anecdotes, with his hapless dad routine sending the audience into a fit of deranged hysteria. Having spent 30 years on the outskirts of show business, Joe's career of palpable mediocrity looked set to be rewarded. However, the entertainment industry, cruel mistress she is, would flush Joe Matarese through her putrid bowels and expel the liquefied husk as quickly as he entered. By 2018, the world's most trolled comedian would be left orbiting the most remote edges of the show business universe, sharing company with the likes of Barry Ribbs and Reverend Bob Levy on comedy's Kuiper Belt. After wasting decades attempting to add a pharmaceutical twist to America's outdated Italian stereotypes, Joe was finally facing the very real possibility of plummeting through the narrow clouds of show business for good. With his dilated pupils darting from his windshield to his Facebook Live chat, Joe Matarese would spend the final months of 2018 narrowly avoiding a series of fatal car accidents. But despite 14% of all driving deaths being caused by mobile phone use, Joe saw himself as a special case, stating, Shouldn't it be legal to text and drive if you do it a lot? Do you know how much better I am at it than most people? Whether in jest or not, the reality is that Joe's indifference to causing potential harm to other motorists is a sad indictment of his unshakable self-indulgence. Here's the highway, and then you'll see him checking, reading the chat, those tiny little things. And sometimes his eyes will be on that phone for a minute and a half, and then he'll look up. He's in a whole different community. He's in a whole different area code <laughs> there. When you look at the statistics, of how many people are actually killed per year from from doing this? I mean, we're we're talking about real murder here. Meanwhile, having survived by the skin of his salami, yet another damning assessment of his life's mistakes in the documentary sequel Italian Psycho, Joe's breadwinning wife Stephanie had seen enough. Simply keeping her husband in a constant state of heavy sedation was no longer working. She would now have to promptly intervene instructing Joe to not create any content where he's talking directly into the camera. Good morning. How are you? I haven't been on Facebook Live in a while. If you've been watching all my other videos, I've been instructed by my wife not to do any videos where I'm talking into the camera. So, uh, I'll be doing a lot of this, I guess. No. I'll, I'll look at you for seconds. How are you? I don't know what I do when I talk, but she says it's not natural. <laughs> I don't know what I do when I talk, but she says it's not natural. Oh man, <laughs> this poor fuck. Imagine everywhere you go, somebody's got something to say about what you do. Even your own wife. I don't know what I do, but she says it's not natural. That's not natural, Joe! <laughs> but it was in everyday encounters where Joe's unnatural interactions would truly surface. The vacant addict was at this point incapable of engaging in day-to-day -day activities, such as buying a mattress with his wife, without making everybody around him severely uncomfortable. The thing with mattresses that's confusing though is this every is store the guy has their own names and their own mattresses. Say hi to my uh, fan base. Hi. He doesn't want to say hi. <laughs> say hi to my fan base. <laughs> and then he looks right at the lens. I've never seen a man so exhausted by this bullshit. You know what I mean? Look, Look at, at that face. Say hi to my fan base. And the guy goes, this is what I gotta do to make a buck. He would submerge himself deeper in hot water following an interaction with trolls in the comment section of his failed web series, Fixing Joe. The scene would depict Joe engaging in romantic conversation with a blonde actress portraying his far more successful wife, prompting comments accusing the domesticated slow brain of real life infidelity. However, Joe's cartoonish overreaction had some believing the comedian was attempting to exploit the negative attention in efforts to drum up interest in his demented creations. People were actually contacting my wife, thinking I was cheating on her, or uh, I was uh, doing something weird. 
because of that video I posted. It's an actress playing my wife. I'm acting. I'm not really thinking about quitting comedy, okay? It's called acting. I guess I'm too good of an actor. Then he puts out this video doing a face swap. And it says, special news report, Howard Cassell reporting on the Joe Matarese scandal. We have a special news break. There was a video posted earlier today that looked like Joe had another woman, but it turned out it was an actress by the name okay. of Rebecca Cush, wow. who was playing <laughs> Joe's wife oh, okay. in a web series oh. from many years past. <laughs> okay. Joe Matarese called me and He's he crazy. said, please do some sort of news special no. telling the world that I'm still with my wife of 13 years. This is insane. This is Howard Cosell reporting, saying Joe's marriage is fine. <laughs> it was an actress playing his wife in a web series. So this is what I think is happening. Either somebody, just two people, trolled Joe's wife and said, oh, he's cheating on you as a joke, which, you know, this video wouldn't help that situation. Or Joe is lying about all of this to pump up his web series, to re-promote it again. Such were the sad depths of Joe Matarese's entertainment career at this point, that in February 2019, he would find himself agreeing to what no other respectable comedian worth his salt, Lenny Marcus aside, would ever lower themselves to. Perform on a cruise ship. Hi. Say hi, say to the, hi to the world. Hello, everybody. Hello, there they world. are, they are. They're both gonna be famous and I'll be out of the business. Wow, well, that's the dream. It's the dream, they're <laughs> hoping to knock me out of the business. And uh, just fucking could, slide right in. You can middle for me one day. Yeah. <laughs> I'll kill myself. Kill myself. I'm doing a cruise next week that starts in uh, Curacao and then goes to a bunch of islands in the Caribbean and then uh, goes to Florida and then I fly home. Said to be the final nail in a comedian's coffin, cruise ships are to comedy what lungs are to a felonious fentanyl addict. And yet, such an embarrassing stigma would once again be lost on Joe, who still found time to shower himself in heedless vanity. With his nipples protruding, very disrespectful, Joe would, without a shred of irony, ask all three ladies still watching his content if they knew a guy like him existed. For a free, fun, free water slide? Freaking, that was crazy. All right, so keep your eye, I think it's on this water slide right here, the one on the right. Uh, completely covered, this is a tube. He's gonna pop out of that pipe right there. This is gonna be exciting. Okay, right, here he comes. Oh, there he was. It's beautiful. And I still miss my wife and kids. It's true. It can happen. Ladies, there's guys like me in the world. Did you know we even existed? After a relaxing week basking in the Aruba sun, Joe's post-cruise tranquility would be immediately replaced with a bout of drug-induced mood swings. His wife Stephanie, an associate professor of neuropsychology, would bear the brunt of Joe's antagonism, with the comedian feeling she was not pulling her weight around the house. Having finally added something almost resembling a real income to the family kitty, the neurotic deadbeat could at last experience what wearing the trousers feels like. This is what happens when you have a wife who focuses on more important things than your walkway or driveway <laughs> being shoveled for you when you return from your cruise gig. And what do I do? Channel the non-medicated old angry me and wish she hired a guy to shovel while I was away. Okay. Apologize to my wife. I really didn't even yell. I didn't really even get that mad. I really exaggerated a little. And uh, this is what I'm doing now. Still, it wasn't long before the old Joe was back, with his frantic pre-vacation delirium once again on display. When not stumbling around his house in a Rocky Balboa haze or bothering construction workers in his basement, Joe, much like a lobotomized Arya Stark, would once again trade his own face for that of comedian Sebastian Maniscalco's. And why have the cold? No, 
making dinner here, you know? Making, uh, I guess you would call it a linguine. Got the water boiling right now. So I keep losing these air, apple airbuds. What do they call it? iPods, airbuds. Airpods, I can't find them. They make them small and white, and then you just can't find them, you know what I mean? Meanwhile, after the widespread lack of interest in his previous podcasting ventures over the years, thanks largely to a compulsion to perpetually reinvent himself, Joe would take yet another dosed up swing at sharing his weekly neuroses. Medicated, an almost carbon copy of his Fixing Joe podcast, would see the comedian once again tread over the same self indulgent ground. How are you today, everybody? Welcome, welcome. This is uh... doing a brand new podcast. It's called Medicated. I'm going to be talking all about how I've helped my mental health over the years by taking Celexa, by taking Adderall. I'm going to talk about what's worked for me, what hasn't worked for me. I'm going to interview different guests and talk about their medications. He thinks like him being depressed and on Prozac and shit is funny or something. And he's just a really insecure psychopath kind of his whole persona of being the the pills comic was just not something people are interested in i don't think people find pill comedy very relatable unsurprisingly the podcast would again fail to take off with not even his assortment of deranged pledges managing to increase his patrons into the double digits how the hell are you folks I missed you. I missed you. There's no way around it. I mean, I, you, you just have to do a podcast. <gasps> you can't not. You can't if not. If you're uh, a comedian. Really? In 2019. Yuck. We've seen this. How many times has he done something called Medicated? Like, literally, he's been doing something called Medicaid. I've seen the logo for three years. How is this any different than what... I, I really feel like we're in a time or... So Joe's doing this whole thing again. And then what happens after this number never goes above two, then he gets in a big fight with everyone again and cancels all this stuff. Convinced it was the environment in which he was recording at fault for the podcast's lack of engagement, Joe would plead with his marital meal ticket for permission to redesign his man cave. And after a light application of elbow grease, Joe's decorative vision would come to life, with a corner of the room plastered in cheap vinyl flooring. First off, uh, I... Uh... I changed my meds. I'll, I'll kind of uh, take my glasses off so you can see my eyes. I talked about lowering the medication, uh, going from 20 milligrams of Celexa down to 10, and uh, and how I yelled at my son's little league coach last week, yelled at my wife last week. Just bit kind of a a loose wire. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. With a newly found confidence fresh from his big studio redesign, Joe would once again rev those medicated engines and start fantasizing. Having done the math, Joe would arrive at the exciting conclusion that, if he had opened for Sebastian Maniscalco at Madison Square Garden, he would have likely gained thousands of shiny new Twitter followers. In Joe's Adderall battered brain, this would somehow justify agreeing to what would be the gig of a lifetime completely free of charge. The trouble is, Sebastian had no intention of reusing Joe at any cost, so this over-enthusiastic round of spaghetti mathematics would be for nothing. I sent him a message on Instagram saying, I'd open for you at the garden for free. Wow. I did the math. I'm like, if I could open for him for six, if I could open for him for like six months, my social media numbers would climb so high, so fast, that I could take that to literally get to the next tier of my comedy career. It would have jumped me up. He gets the good feeling thinking about the fantasy, and because he's on the pills, he tricks himself into thinking that good feeling is happening because he did something good. And he's now he's going, hey, nice. Oh wait, none of that's happened yet. Uh-oh. The medicated podcast would reach new lows following a despairing tweet begging for more than his eight Patreon subscribers, before attacking his 16,000 Twitter followers for being poor. He'd finish with a charitable incentive, offering to pledge 50% of all proceeds to a mental health foundation, 
although based on his earnings at the time this would likely be seen as a confusing insult. Ultimately, no amount of shameless plugging would edge his patronage upwards, with Joe now going toe to toe with Josh Denny for the prize of least engaged audience. So he's saying here he's got 16,000 Twitter followers, what the fuck are they all poor? LOL? He's got to reach his goal of 120, get to paying. So this is a man who's learned nothing over the years. I have 16,000 Twitter followers, 16,000 people clicked a single button, therefore they should all be giving me money. What Joe doesn't understand is people following him on Twitter doesn't translate into, oh, I'm gonna pay $5 for Joe's shitty pills podcast. In fact, so poorly received was the podcast that the live Facebook chat would eventually become entirely inundated with a series of bizarre comments from Todd Detter and Ashley Butterfield. Fans of the Red Bar radio show had long been keeping tabs on Joe's harebrained antics, and with a new podcast came new methods of torment. During a medicated episode featuring Fat Gimp Preston Gitlin, the spamming in the chat of Red Bar's Patrick Melton would have Joe believing his own fans had come up with a new nickname for his tubby little guest. Uh, everyone tell Butch Bradley one Melton. I don't know what half these people write. They have their own fucking, like, uh, lingo here. And I'm guessing that they've already come up with a nickname for you. Melton is basically Carmen San Santiago. Uh, <laughs> they must think my name's Melton. Is that what it is? It's, probably, it's, it's Preston, 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 Preston. Preston. It kind of sounds like Melton. Melton lies about doing many podcasts when in fact he will do just one or two. Melton wore a single pair of jeans for a month in <laughs> Afghanistan. Wow, Melton wore a single pair of jeans for a month in Afghanistan. You know what these guys would love? Uh, should I just call you Melton? <laughs> call me Melton. Call me whatever the hell Melton you want. Melton constantly tells me that I'm not stupid. Imagine getting your name changed by an accidental mistake. Thanks, Preston. This, Melton. It, this is a pleasure. For having me. For I, having I got you. A, I, <laughs> for me having you. I got a new nickname. Yeah, I got to see New Rochelle. Ironically, the self-help podcast would come to a rather depressing end, with Joe streaming a three-part exhibition in Hopped Up Humiliation. After experiencing an array of technical difficulties resulting in the abrupt ending of the episode, Joe, clearly off his tits on pills, would quickly return, this time broadcasting from his phone. He would spend the first 27 minutes being baited into discussing Anthony Cumia's former child bride, specifically how the MAP advocate took pleasure sinking his vampiric fangs deep into Danny Brand's flesh. You need to go back on Cumia soon, you haven't been on since he hired Lando. I don't know about, I don't know, I just, um, I'm at a loss about going on those shows that have, I can't say the word anymore, but it's just fucking everybody hates my fucking guts over there. I heard a rumor Anthony Kumi has bit Vinny's daughter's hand, is that true? Well, they got in that big fight on uh, streaming video, I mean, that, you know that, right? You saw that, everybody saw that. That was just a weird relationship, Vinny Brand's daughter. And Anthony Cumia, that I think is older than Vinny Brand. That's weird. God, I hope that never happens with me, where my daughter's like fucking young and dating some like old man in the comedy business. I don't know what hand biting thing you're talking about, but that's okay. Yeah, I don't know about that either. So you're pro biting. Cumia is sick. My worst fear is my daughter being snatched up by Cumia. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. No one would fuck your daughter, don't worry. Yeah, she's seven. I love when you flash your bulge. Can you see that? Is there a bulge? With a heavy dose of amphetamine still coursing through his central nervous system, Joe would again return with a third stream, claiming to be unsatisfied with his previous sign-off. After being ordered by his 11-year-old son Luke to start wrapping up, Joe would make one final frenetic attempt to convince his detractors to stop teasing the comedian and instead be absorbed into the Joe Matarese fan base. Oh, it's Luke. You want a charger? I only have one charger and I'm on like 3% right now. You took that charger like an hour ago. How are you on 3%? Calling people's trolls is dehumanizing. Okay, well, okay, I shouldn't call them trolls. We'll call them people that hate anything you do no matter what i mean maybe they wouldn't hate everything but it seems like uh that's how i define people that 
no matter what. They just have made their decision. We are comedy fans. Yes, that's true. You are comedy fans. But I don't really know how to interact with you. It's your, I don't know. I don't know what you like. I would love to give you what you want. I would love <laughs> for you to just be like, fucking Manorese, fucking hilarious. I love him, man. I love him. Did I make fans out of you guys? I'll, I promise. I'll stop calling you guys trolls. Let's, let's have a truce. Stop calling you guys trolls. I'll call you comedy fans. Um, I would love it if you guys could teach me how to make you guys my fans and make you like me. I need this. I like, I like the connection, you know? I mean, I don't mind you shitting on me. It's fine. But I would actually like you to like go, you know what? I like Joe. I'm going to go see Joe, or I'm going to go watch Joe do his, I'm going to watch a live stream of Joe, I like Joe, I want you to actually like me, so if there's something in me that I do that you like, you can, you can voice it here, and it seems like it's this, I guess it's, I overreact, you know, because some of the guys like, you know, put my fucking address and my, you know, they do all kind of weird shit, call clubs as me. And then, uh, you know, some of those clubs don't book me anymore because I know it's a pain in the ass. And uh, I need those clubs, to be honest. I need to make a living. It's just all throughout his career since trolls were the only ones like Red Bar and the OP and Anthony subreddit were the only people giving him attention. So he's thinking he's got to turn this into some sort of money. He thinks he's going to make money off it, basically. He thought, if I don't react like a complete fag and I actually try to play along with this they might even start liking me because that's you know, that was one of the criticisms levied that Anthony and Opie and all those people is you know they love the bus balls but they have the, the thinnest skin and they can't take a joke themselves so if Joe actually had played along with it and but he's too much of a fucking retard he can't actually do that he doesn't know what he's playing along with with Joe seemingly unable to attract any sort of new audience outside people looking to make fun of him, he would finally give his number one fan the attention she deserves. At long last, the comedian would agree to meet Karen from Philly, a middle-aged transgender woman with an unhealthy obsession for all things Matarese, after performing in Philadelphia. Having spent the last two years of his career struggling for any sort of organic approval, this brief moment of adoration was a much-needed respite for Joe. You're not gonna believe it. But Karen from Philly, ladies and gentlemen, Karen from hey, Philly hey. is here. Can you believe this hey, shit? Hey, what's up, everybody? How are you? <laughs> this is so lit. I'm with Joe, and he's performing, and I can't wait for this show. He's um, going to be at the Borgata, <laughs> and it's so exciting, and I love him so much, and he's my favorite comedian. I can't believe I'm sitting here with Karen from Philly. It's like fucking crazy. <laughs> Because it's like she hated me, but then she loved me, and then there were guys on her show that hated me, and then they said they didn't hate me. It was very confusing. With no real marketable skills or notable talent to fall back on, Joe's post-medicated impulse would be to once again repackage another failed podcast and release it under a new name. Life of Joe would see the washed-up narcoleptic take a more slice-of-life approach, giving the 16 people still paying attention a peek behind the matrimonial curtain. He shouldn't be sharing anything because anything he does share is cringe. He's, he's got nothing to share, so I don't know what's going on in his day-to-day -day life that he could even think to be talking about. But it's a step in the right direction. At least he's not talking about medications and pills. Like, that's the type of comedy people want to hear. No one cares about his day-to-day -day life. I, jo Joe running errands to get his pills or whatever the fuck. I can't imagine what the, what the, what he would have to share. He gives up too much information to a creep like me, and now I really know how to hurt his feelings. So I think it's better off if he just doesn't podcast at all. However, opening up to this extent would come with its fair share of comical pitfalls, such as the time Joe discussed selling his wife's $800,000 home and using the proceeds to fund his career. I don't know how far down the downsizing is. I started just experimenting. I said to my wife, well, you know, let's just go look. Let's go look at apartments. Let's see, like, what if we just rented an apartment? We don't even buy it. 
we just rent one. Now we sell our house. All the equity we have in the house becomes liquid money and we can invest it in things and we can, we can change our life where we can do more things. We can invest in our careers. She could invest even more in her career if she needed to. You can see how successful I am, right? You guys know where I'm at in this business. I'm not hiding it. I'm being very honest. This is where I am. So do I hire a team, you know? Do we strategize? Do we really make this a brand where it's very consistent all the way through? I could sell the house. I put my kids in an apartment. Now we have money. I start investing in myself. I start going to LA as much as I possibly can. I have some sort of team behind me. I know this is what I want to do. I know the dream. I see it in my head. I know what it is. Oh my God, I didn't realize he wants to sell their family home, move them all into a small apartment in yes. the Bronx so that he could have extra money to build a team yes. out. Okay, that's yes. gnarly. <laughs> so basically what he's saying is he wants to gamble. On we should take out the equity on the house and take it to Vegas. <laughs> I could play blackjack with the money for the house. Here's my keys. I'll put it all up. Wow. So he wants to throw away his family's well-being so that he could be famous. What kind of money can you invest into comedy? Like, there's there's comics that are poor as shit and they're hilarious. Money isn't going to help you. There's no production that needs to be behind you, Joe, that's going to make Joe Matteris better, you know? It, it's, his, it's, it's, it's his brain. His brain's broken. This new share-everything approach left Joe living life like an open wound hand-feeding his trolls a veritable bounty of hyperactive cringe in the process. And when not actively working towards downsizing his family's living conditions for the sake of another botched web series, Joe would find increasingly unhinged ways of wasting time. Writing and performing a musical in his living room could go down as one of the most mental of comedic moves since Artie Lang's infamous incidents of self-sabotage. It was a two-year program, but I had a feeling, you know? That I would need four years to finish. Joe Matarese, everybody. Nice update from him. That's what he's been up to. That was slop, man. That shit sucked. I give that a 1.1. It was around this time that Joe discovered Cameo, a service in which penniless celebrities record personalized video messages in exchange for a fee. He figured with his maniacal roster of unconvincing face swaps, the platform would fit the wannabe wise guy like one of Rocky's fingerless leather gloves. But with his Patreon subscriber count still in the single digits, it's hard to see who in their right mind would possibly be compelled to pay for a Joe Matteris Cameo. Hey, happy birthday, porcelain. This is your buddy, Joe Matarese. How you doing? You're catching me post gym, just walking out of the New York Sports Club. Uh, in my car, AirPods in, wanted to wish you a heartfelt happy birthday. Enjoy the day. I don't know if today's your birthday, yesterday was your birthday, tomorrow's your birthday. Maybe it's in uh, a month and a half. You never know. But uh, happy birthday, Porcelain. Love to know your real name. Meanwhile, interest in the comedian's Life of Joe podcast was at such a desperate state that he would once again resort to exploiting his own family for the sake of a few clicks. Having seen a slight uptick in user engagement following an episode featuring his wife Stephanie, Joe would relentlessly pester the tenured professor to drop whatever she's doing and help keep his comedy career afloat. Having spent her day performing the functions associated with a respectable profession, coming home to the frenzied antics of a maladjusted freeloader hardly qualifies as taking a load off. With Stephanie's patience at this point worn so thin it could liquefy in the pan with just a little oil, Joe's incessant badgering would result in a spectacular revelation. On episode 29 of the Life of Joe podcast, Stephanie would declare she no longer wishes to be in any way included in her husband's farcical career in comedy. I was asking what advice he had for you for dealing with the highs and lows of the business because it just seems to me lately that you're kind of on like 
you're dangling by a thread or something that it does not take a lot to make you very upset and to put you into a depression. Well, I just feel like you always want to have a talk. Like there's always like there's always a crisis or always a about my career. It does I don't know. No, not necessarily, but I think that your unhappiness from your career feeds your unhappiness in general. It's the same thing that I think about when you think, oh, if we downsize, if we get an apartment, if we move, like that's not going to make us a difference to your mood. I think it's a combination of being worn down and exhausted <laughs> fighting this force that never seems to stop of, oh, be good for my career if my fans see my family. That always seems to be like the message I get, which is just do this, please, because it'll be good for my career. Do the podcast because people like to hear you. Do the reality show because that would give me exposure. Do this because. It... So I. No, that reality show was for the 20 grand. No, that, that was we also... did win. It was also you said it would be good for my career. I'm, 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 I've been fighting the it'll be good for my career um, battle a very, very long time. And I think I'm tired. That's number one. Do you disagree with that? I don't think it really makes a difference. In the 15 years that we've been together, I, I see no pattern of this is good for your career. I think I just what do you think have is going to reached make an age. I'm still <laughs> answering Ron. I, I, I've, I think I've reached an age that I don't, I just don't care as much of anymore. I mean, I don't do social media, but I've kind of just accepted that it's sort of the way of the world. And it was um, equally probably more tiring to to keep trying to say don't put me in the video don't take pictures don't do this don't do that than it is to just be like okay whatever fine i mean i'm tired and then i'm and and then i'm tired on another level i'm tired of trying so hard for this career with you it it just feels like it never ends it feels like well i'll, I'll be done in 2 minutes and we'll go downstairs it just feels like no matter what um, we have one more call for you. It's bro. never going to be where I'm like, hey, Joe, okay, great. You did your work. I did my work. Let's hang. It's always going to be, Steph, can you do this for my career? Like, that's what it feels like. It feels like I have a second job. That's probably the hook of the show, though. It's probably like it's bad for us, but good for them. Right. But, you know, when it's like five people. <laughs> it's not five people. Why I'm, do you say because that? Because only the same people call. So she's basically laying it all out there. Joe has been begging me, do this. It'll be good for my career. Let me put the kids in this Instagram post. It'll be good for my career. Come on the podcast. It'll be good for my career. She's saying, it's never been good for your career. It's never amounted to squat. Joe, it's time to get a real job. Working at Starbucks would be more honorable than what you're doing to your wife. She assumes you have five listeners. That is cockatude. The illusion is gone. Joe's nothing. He's asking her for money to fund shit. He's talking about selling the house, which you know he didn't run by her. There's no way he ran this by her. At this point, just stop. That's all I... If, if there's anything Joe should take away from this, it's just stop. But still, the penny rattling inside the Selexa-soaked tissue of Joe's defective brain would still refuse to drop. He would once again surmise that the root cause of his podcasting difficulties laid not with the host's inability to captivate an audience, but with the environment in which he was broadcasting from. Having seen podcast kingpin Luis J. Gomez move his bloated network to the Big Apple, Joe figured he'd allocate a portion of the potential downsizing funds to an expensive New York City studio. And with Gas Digital stuffing its schedule with a broadcasting equivalent of rectal discharge, Joe would conclude that renaming the same lifeless hour of therapeutic drivel over and over would constitute a podcast network. Uh, my sister-in-law uh, works in these offices. I'm friends with uh, her boss, and uh, they do a very creative job. All the, They do have editing suites in here and everything, and he had extra offices, and uh, we're renting one. Without even hearing the podcast, I can tell you what happened. You went to L.A., you saw the people have this, they have it, it's a good idea for them, so I need to do it. Joe, you need to sit still with an idea for longer than three seconds. There's a lot of people in New York that have uh, studios. I mean, yeah, uh, Anthony Cumia has one. Uh, 
uh, Luis Gomez has his own network, right? Yeah. Uh, Schultz now has Schul- one. Andrew Schultz has one. This isn't just for podcasting. This is like where I'm going to write. This is where I'm going to do my, my work. This is where I'm going to, um, you know, just kind of... Uh, I wanted to feel like I have a fucking job. What was wrong with the spare room with the locked door three levels up? I mean, he was in his attic before. You know why I'm not getting any DLs, Donalds? Uh, probably because I'm in my fucking spare room. Yeah, that's the ticket. Listen, these guys have studios. They have the upper hand. (laughs) Nobody gives a shit about studios. I think taking on a bunch of debt to buy a studio would actually not be a good idea for him. It would probably not go very well, because it's not going very well for Anthony Cumia, and he's the most famous broadcaster of all time, second to the Howard Stern. Guests aren't Joe's problem. He got the guests. He had the the live show at the Village Underground, you know? Having now reached the tragic stage of throwing spaghetti at a wall, an exasperated Joe would be left begging his own supporters for some much-needed help. The serial podcast killer was looking to build an elite team, with the express goal of elevating a career approaching its final death rattle back into significance. But given Joe's insistence that volunteers would have to cut their rates a little bit in hopes it amounts to something bigger, it's hard to see anybody taking this absurd opportunity seriously. Why I'm talking about this on the podcast, if you're out there, if you're a listener, or you're a friend, you're a fan, you've been following my career, Here's the people that I need. And, you know, Mitch started as a fan, so maybe there's other people out there. I'd love to have somebody who likes what I do on on this team, you know. I, I'm willing to put, you know, money. I'm not asking you to do it for free, but, you know, you're going to have to cut your rate a little bit for me and hope this amounts to something bigger. That's probably the biggest person I need on, uh, on this team team that I'm trying to build right now somebody who's really savvy on that and uh, and sees the potential and wants to step in and like those are the guys I like want on my team those guys that might have like some sort of financial uh, side to it because I've thought that for years that could a comedian be like a racehorse or a boxer where people buy in to try to make money there's no Joe Matteris fan that's 20 years old, no job, looking for any way to get his foot in the door. That's this is just, it's a fantasy that Joe is living where he thinks that someone could even respond to this and it not be someone fucking with him. He doesn't a- appeal to the young audience. He doesn't need someone who's good on social media. He's not all he has is his like Sopranos impression. That's it. Despite enduring 30 agonizing years trying to break into comedy's mainstream, Joe's pitiful career in entertainment would be left with all the traction of a hockey puck. With his back once again flat against his vinyl flooring wall, a panicked Joe would revert to type, releasing two brand new podcasts back to back. What's so funny would see Joe link up with psychologist Matt Bellis to stomp over the same worn out ground of self-serving tedium, whilst 5 in 10 would at least offer some degree of creative flair, with Joe asking fellow comedians five rapid fire questions in 10 minutes. He would eventually lose interest in both ventures. Welcome to, uh, let's see here, what is it, the, uh, the very first virtual, the very first virtual What's So Funny. Because I guarantee you, if Ellen DeGeneres' cat got sick, she put that motherfucker in a limo and sent him to the vet. I had to walk like fucking uh, uh, Pippi Longstockings. With the increasing spread of coronavirus putting the world in a state of forced lockdown, Joe was faced with the terrifying prospect of losing his weekly $50 spot at Dangerfields. In efforts of keeping his receding quiff above water, Joe would attempt to bring the live experience to his handful of fans with an amateur Zoom variety show he'd call Comedy Jukebox. Not only were the performances on display the wrong side of dreadful, Joe's attempts to have viewers request their favorite comedy bits would continuously fall on deaf ears. But it was Joe's bizarre 10 minute pre-show introduction that would leave the most amusing impression, with the comedian for some reason staring vacantly at the camera throughout the entire countdown.
be fun to throw requests out there. If there's an old stand-up bit of mine that maybe you saw me do somewhere and you're like, can you still do it? It was really fun. You're not requesting anything. We lost it. We lost it. I guess I got, I got boring somewhere in the middle there. Well, I still don't see any comedy requests, but you know, they're coming. Some people say they want to hear some comedy. You want me to do something? <laughs> no one's requesting any stand-up bits. <laughs> Let me put my set list up again. With comedy clubs closed to the public for the foreseeable future, Joe's nostalgic one-man extravaganza, Remember When, a show littered with antiquated references only your parents could possibly relate to, would sadly be left by the wayside. But with the comedian's propensity to turn just about any pasta-brained idea into a podcast, his one-man show would inevitably go the same way. As for how well received this latest venture was, I believe Joe's beloved Tony Soprano said it best. Remember when is the lowest form of conversation. Do you remember the first time you had sex? The first person you had sex with? Do you remember when MTV first came out and there were bands that you just shouldn't be able to see? Remember when club DJs used to slow it down at the end of the night to give you that one last chance? Just a little quick little tease, a little tease for tomorrow night. Brand new podcast starting. Live podcast, video podcast, every Thursday. It's going to be called Remember When. It's kind of uh, connected to my one-man show that I did uh, at a bunch of theaters. Again, if he wasn't incompetent, if he wasn't retarded, if he wasn't just poor at comedy, he probably could turn nostalgia bait into a career. Isn't there enough 80s nostalgia out there already? Like, I'm I'm so sick of it. Like, every, everything new has to be... It's the member berries thing, you know? It's just everything's nostalgia and 80s and... Ugh, enough already. Having at this point all but given up on the unending misfortunes of his own career, Joe would look to the next generation in hopes of Neil Brennaning his way to the top. For just $100 an hour, Aspiring comedians could receive the invaluable wisdom of a 30-year has-been on his way out of show business, with lessons in what not to do, what to open with and how to get booked all included in the official Joe Mattarese syllabus. Remarkably, he would somehow manage to recruit two paying clients, although one was later revealed to be a red bar plant. In line with previous endeavours, Joe's mentoring programme was quickly discontinued. Doing a uh, new thing, which is comedy mentor comedy mentor that's what i'm trying to do is anyone interested in stand-up what do you want to know maybe i can pull the curtain back i'm doing it with one guy so far where i kind of look at it as a mentorship um and the way i kind of do it is not only sure you pay me hourly to work with you but then i actually uh I get you gigs, I get you jobs, even though the COVID-19 is happening right now and there's, there's no gigs going around. Well, Joe Matteris is back and he's running a comedy class and this is so weird. Have you ever wished you could hire a comedy coach or mentor? Someone will get you gigs too. <laughs> Text me for more info. So he's resorted to this. If you have credits and you're a competent person, you could swindle enough people into paying for comedy classes. It's just unfortunate that Joe's high all the time and he can't get anything done. Back at home, the perpetual absurdity of Joe Matarese would result in one of the most amusing moments in the comedian's bottomless lore. In a video littered with the most basic of culinary mistakes, Joe would dedicate a full day-night cycle attempting to cook a pizza in his $400 Weber grill. He would first forget to flour the chopping board, resulting in Joe having to peel away clumps of dough before trying his darndest to place them evenly on the grill. As the sun set beneath the horizon, it was evident the comedian had given up with his initial efforts and started over in the middle of the night. And with the majority of footage shot in pitch black, it's a mystery why anybody in their right mind would unironically share this.
completely fucked it up. And then you close the lid. Little note. They don't need to look like perfectly shaped pizzas. So he tries to slide it. And he's trying to move the dough. And obviously the dough is stuck. He just put, he didn't put any flour on the board. It's olive oil gluing the dough to the wood. It's clearly (laughs) daytime (laughs) while he's making these pizzas. Now he's just taken loose dough, crumbled up in a ball, thrown it on the grill and then try to open it apart. It really looks horrible. I mean, it looks like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, yeah, like a ghost or, uh, Like if you shot a paintball, (laughs) those two pizzas that we saw, those aren't there anymore. He hasn't said anything about it. He didn't say, I messed those up. I started again, day turned to night. None of it. When not engaged in his never ending line of lackluster podcasts, Joe would slip back into the comfort of his phone's deep fake technology, recording even more embarrassing skits as his fictional mafia idol, Tony Soprano. The woke Pranos would see the comedian add an ideological twist to David Chase's much celebrated show, portraying New Jersey's head of the family as a socially conscious activist. The concept would strangely feature on an episode of Saturday Night Live almost beat for beat, although the notion of Lorne Michaels monitoring Joe Matarisi's social media feed is a little far-fetched to say the least. But it was Joe's insistence that adding a cheap cartoonish filter somehow qualified the video as an animation that would leave viewers scratching their communal heads. Give me a name, give me a name. White supremacists and white supremacists. Proud boys. Proud boys. Stand back and stand by, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Baka boot. Somebody's got to do something about it. Could even Putin is saying what the fuck? This is not a right wing problem. Not in my house. Shut this off. This fucking cisgendered white patriarch cannot denounce white supremacy? What the fuck is this world coming to? It is not animated. Don't get excited. He's put on this weird filter that kind of cartoonizes the lines of a video. You've seen this, it looks awful. Meanwhile, with his wife busy keeping the Matarese household afloat, Joe would have plenty of time during the day to get a little wacky and work on his creations. His latest pet project would involve a series of popular movie clips, with Joe dubbing over the actors' voices with shoddy impressions and badly written dialogue. With Joe under the impression that giving these disturbing concepts a name somehow validates whatever it is he's doing, watching classics would only leave viewers questioning whether Joe should be forcefully committed. Yo, isn't that nice? We don't need a 1979 Trans Am. If I remove your spine, we could have sex in the back seat, you know? Why are you always horny? Me? Yeah, you. Come on, Adrian, I mean, look at you. What did you say? What did you say? Did you call me a guinea fuck? I bought this leather jacket in Italy. This is 100% lambskin. You say that again, you're dead. Oh, I like the all black. It's very slimming. Great choice. Very Italy Italian, not Staten Island. Okay. In pursuit of much needed confidence, Joe would channel his inner teenage girl and get himself a makeover. Having at this point beaten the dead horse of Goomba stereotypes to within an inch of its life, Joe would turn over the final Italian rock still left untouched. This new fashion kick would see the comedian completely reinvigorated, with his Instagram feed dominated by a horde of male models. This sudden infatuation with all things style saw Joe pathetically fawn over the likes of David Beckham, George Clooney and even Mark Maron, with the comedic tweaker on the prowl for a new gimmick. A short-lived weekly fashion pop quiz would quickly put an end to Joe's bizarre foray into all things Vogue. We're here on Facebook Live. I'm Joe Matarese. We do this every Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on Facebook Live. And what it is, it's a fashion pop quiz. I'm laying out all this style type stuff on all my social media. You're probably noticing it. There's a lot of social media content that revolves around style i have a fashion designer remaking everything that uh changing the way i dress and my whole look oh no joe matteris has started to work on a pinterest board about 10 stories of new looks he wants to try and it's all like sexy stuff from 2008 
Like this guy, what's his name? Um, David, David Beckham. David Beckham. With almost everything Joe touching turning to Ragu, some much needed reflection was desperately needed, if the comedian was ever going to claw his way back into the world of slightly more serious entertainment. Chrissy Mayer, a used up gummy hag of no real consequence, would offer Joe a platform to exchange war stories, musing on their mutual hardships at the hands of internet trolls. And whilst Chrissy was clearly using the comedian as a self serving vehicle to gain red bar coverage for herself, it seemed as though Joe, for this brief moment at least, had actually grown. Like, what have you learned from your previous, like, interactions with trolls or, you know, do you feel like the work you've done now, you'd be like, ah, if I could go back, I wouldn't have reacted yeah, in X, yeah, Y, Z way. Yeah, I defin de definitely look back and go, whoa, that was a rookie mistake. The example I had was was with Red Bar that yeah, I was yeah, going to talk about. The, my, I was going to say ours is with the same person. So if, you know you know when you talk about it here, it's gonna end up on yeah. his show. I've and gotten like, used to that. I know that yeah. uh, and you if know what? I do anything, I'm ending up on his show, anything. <laughs> the trolls don't know that you were a rookie at Trolls. I never had them before, I didn't know. I didn't even know it bothered me. It's like I was working on some whole other thing. Um, and this was like this new thing that like found a little crease in my brain that was still open that I didn't know about. And the first time it started to happen, I did the dumbest shit you could do. He tried to explain it to me when I got mad the first time that I saw it happening. And if you get mad, then he likes that even more and leans yeah. into it even harder. I, I like if, if every, you're, I he's getting every, to you, yeah. yeah. I did every rookie mistake. I wrote an email. To him? I wrote an email immediately. They made fake accounts. They made death threats at comedy clubs I was going to do where I almost wow. lost the gig. <laughs> And then I've had them make exact pages that look just like my social media pages and contact bookers that they saw I had on my tour list <laughs> and said they were me and they needed to cancel the week. Oh, wow. That's very detailed. That's a lot of work to put in. And you've seen these full documentaries that this one guy makes on porcelain. Like two or three of them. Yeah. Full, this guy, full but, length. This guy's name is Porcelain. He's done a couple documentaries on comics, one on you, one on Jim Norton. Um, was it at all flattering? <laughs> no, I mean... it's not flattering. And then he likes to contact <laughs> you like he's your buddy and he doesn't, he, it's like, dude, I'm too confused to even try to figure this shit out. I don't even want to figure it out. I don't care what, like I do, I'm on Cameo, you know? Yes, they, I'm on Cameo too. So I've had people that are, that are friends with him contact me, want me to do a video for porcelain for his birthday and I'm like I said <laughs> That's listen funny. if you want to pay me the $40 <laughs> I don't care I'll do it they look nervous but it is relieving for them right they feel relief talking about it. they're like we talked about red bar and we're still here it's a therapy session no you're session. not trust me there will be consequences all the people that they're talking about it's terrible what they've done to them i mean <laughs> well what not what they did to Chrissy but to Joe Matteris i mean they went too far and Remember, Joe was being trolled by uh, five different communities at one point. You know, the, the thing the trolls don't know is that I didn't know about trolls, so how could I be blamed? <laughs> what are you talking about? It's not an excuse, and nobody's ever canceled these people's gigs. We call up the comedy clubs nonstop. Yeah, the comedy clubs is very funny. Hey, it's me, Joe Matteris. Yeah, calling in sick. Sorry. Well, I guess that's a cancel. He actually wrote me an email. He goes, you sing good, fellas. You know what happens to people that talk too much. That's what he said. He goes, what happens? They die? I'm not concocting ideas about you. I'm showing you what you've done and explaining why it's wrong. It was around this time that Joe Matarese would give up on all current projects and start yet another new podcast, this time based entirely on Stallone's Rocky series. Having met the official Yo Philly Rocky film tour guide Mike Kunder during an episode of Remember When, Joe figured a podcast centered around the universe of a 40-year-old franchise couldn't possibly do as poorly as its predecessors. From pretender to contender would at least represent a welcome break from his usual self-absorbed pill talk. Hey guys, Mike Kunder from the Yo Philly Rocky Film Tour. On the screen is my friend, Joe Matarese. He's a, a pretty famous comedian uh, who's got this thing since birth. It's called Comedic Genius. I just started a new podcast. It's called 
from pretender to contender with uh, my partner on the show. His name's Mike Kunda from the uh, Pretender documentary. And you also might know him because he does this uh, huge tour in Philadelphia called the Yo Philly Rocky Film Tour. It's me. (laughs) It's not Rocky. (laughs) Joel. We are back for episode five from Pretender to Contender. How are you, my friend? I'm good. But with the swift realization that nobody in 2021 either knows or cares about Rocky Balboa, Joe would hedge his bets with the inception of, yes, you guessed it, another new podcast. Let's Be Friends would see Joe and co-host Chrissy Gucciarelli literally dial it in from the first episode, with no real theme or purpose outside of reading listener comments. With the pair opening the lines to initially pre-approved callers, the overall lack of interaction saw Joe take calls from just about anybody in efforts of filling the uncomfortable silence. As expected, the comedian's many disparages found their way onto the show, with one caller even referring to a certain Goodfellas scene where the one guy just wouldn't shut the fuck up. Joe, I'm a huge fan. I remember when the comedy tour and the podcast uh, used to happen before this pandemic. It got me thinking, remember when you had uh, an income that didn't involve your wife? (laughs) Hey, Joe, what's going going on? Is this the uh, Chris Russo uh, documentary guy? Yeah, uh, I actually had a a different question, though. Have you ever seen Goodfellas? No. (laughs) You haven't seen Goodfellas? No, what's it about? Uh, It's just about this guy who won't shut the fuck up. I just got one more question. What's what? What is it? Why? <laughs> I love this guy. Someone else says, uh, "Live porcelain." Hey, Joe, it's porcelain. I left a voicemail, but I guess it didn't go through. Here's my question. I love these. I love these fans that like they'll, they'll just know everything. You know what I mean? And you won't even remember yeah. you said it on episode 19. This is classic. On episode 19 of Life of Joe. Your wife, Stephanie, expressed her exhaustion of your podcasting difficulties and depression before saying she didn't want to be involved in your career. She suggested nothing seems to be helping and that the same five people listen. With that said, why another podcast? (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Meanwhile, Joe's relationship with professional cringe artist Mike Kunder had taken a complete nosedive, with resentment brewing over the uneven allocation of work between the two towards the podcast. Joe felt Kunder had only agreed to the partnership as a result of having nothing better to do, and with his more pressing commitments, such as waltzing around Philadelphia dressed as some sort of Soviet paedophile, it seemed the Rocky Impressionist simply didn't have time for Joe's pickled brain shenanigans. Joe would quickly replace Kunda with who appeared to be the comedian's new bulbous nosed therapist in the monotonous Chris Gucci. This would likely spell an end to the Let's Be Friends podcast after just one episode, with Joe Matteris now absorbed into something called the Chop Sports Network. Sounds like a winner. I am going to uh, I'm going to take the higher road, and I, I, you know, so Mike is no longer with me. Mike's no longer uh, the co-host. He wrote me this text and he's like, let's just, you know, it's, you know, these people that do this, it's like, everything's cool. Let's just end it. Uh, let's just end as friends. And then they like shit on you. I'm like, what, what, what? that's not friendly. Well, I tried. Yeah. Why are you, th- why are you saying Tell me how you really feel? That's what shocked me. Cause I knew that we weren't right to podcast together, but I didn't think we were wrong to be friends, but I guess that's not going to happen because yeah. it, it got You can't really mix weird. business sometimes with with friendship. I'm not good at being honest and saying, "Hey man, I'm doing everything." Like, yeah, I'm not, You want to just get out of this? Joe would even leave some rather entertaining parting words for yours truly, questioning why anybody would possibly bother dedicating a three-part documentary series on a subject like Joe Matarese. Good point. And despite acknowledging the previous documentary's view count, comedy's most pitiful clown would ask the question, what does that do for you? Again, good point. That caller last week who said that funny why, like when he when we laughed, 
when he said why doll. can you just tell me he, yeah that porcelain guy like led us on that long trail and, and then he said why at the end I mean which is funny because I started thinking about it afterwards I'm like this guy's about to la- launch his third documentary full length about Joe Matarese and he's saying why to me it's why fucking me? funny yeah. right because I was like I, I know you get like a hundred he'll get he's gotten 180,000 views on one of the documentaries about me but that still doesn't do what does that do for you how does you better get you five feel? million views this suggestion that content must have some sort of wider objective outside the most fundamental notion of finding something funny is precisely the reason why joe has for so long struggled in podcasting Having spent years rebranding the same worn-out concepts to no effect, Joe's relentless efforts to force upon his shrinking listenership another of his impulsive podcast ideas is actually resulting in the inverse of its intended result. The fundamental problem to Joe's process is that he both arrives at and ultimately gives up on these ideas far too hastily. The occasional good concept he stumbles across is rarely given room to breathe, and is so quickly replaced with yet another in Joe's catalogue of self-indulgent duds, that he no longer knows what actually works and why. Until Joe realises that he has to give his audience a viable and convincing reason to engage in his content, especially in the ultra-competitive field of podcasting, no amount of witty titles, wacky gimmicks or desperate rebrands are ever going to work. 